Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Never have I been more generously introduced as a failure in a fringe, uh, <coughs> and, in t and I'm sorry to say entirely accurately so. It is a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I have only 10, 15 or so minutes to, to make an argument, uh, to look at the status of animals within the Christian tradition. And of course, it's really impossible be, uh, to do that adequately. So what I have to offer is a very brief overview in the hope that it will provide some basis for you coming back in questions for the last 10 minutes or so. Now, the question is, can Christianity become good news for animals? Well, the bad news, folks, is that this is a real question. You know, uh, I mean, <coughs> um, there's a, um, uh, what do you call it, Jehovah's Witness, is it? Uh, 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 Kingdom Hall, and outside they sometimes have questions like, you know, did Jesus raise from the, rise from the dead, or was Jesus the son of God, and so on. And well, you've got a pretty good idea of what the answer to many of these questions are. Well, in this case, it's, I'm sorry to say, a real question. <laughs> a very real question, and um, I'm afraid um, <clears throat> we cannot be sanguine about the answer. So first of all, let's look at the negative tradition. Those people who say, actually, Christianity can't be good news for animals, at least in terms of contemporary ethical concern. And that is simply because the dominant negative voices, dominant voices are negative voices. By that, I don't mean the truest or the, or the most biblical or the most spiritual. I simply mean those that are the most prevalent within the tradition are still heavily negative. And so we have to recognize the role of Christian theology in legitimating, if not originating, certainly propagating negative ideas. It's these negative ideas that rule the world and have done so for many, many years. So let's briefly look at the negative tradition. Animals are defined out of the picture. No mind, no reason, no soul, no sentience, no rights, and no status. Let's look at these briefly in turn. Dumb animals, notice that phrase. Dumb animals and plants are devoid of the life of reason, whereby to set themselves in motion they are moved as it were by a natural impulse, a sign of which is that they are naturally enslaved and accommodated to the uses of others. St. Thomas Aquinas uh, church father, arguably the most important church father in the Catholic tradition. Dumb animals. They have no independent movement, as it were, as a result of rational faculties. They are naturally our slaves. No soul. Uh, in the Thomist tradition, that's the tradition following St. Thomas Aquinas, broadly there are three divisions, vegetative souls, vegetables, animated souls for animals, and rational souls for humans. It's not true to say, as many people do, that the Christian tradition or the Catholic tradition specifically denies that animals have souls. It has always denied that they have rational and therefore immortal souls. Do you see? I hope that's clear. So we move from the idea that they have no, um, no mind, no reason, they have no soul, Therefore, because they are not rational, and therefore the question has to be raised, as indeed it was by Descartes, whether they could have sufficient self-consciousness even to feel pain. Indeed, says Descartes, they act naturally and mechanically like a clock. There is no prejudice to which we are more accustomed from our earliest years than the belief that dumb animals think. Hence was born Cartesianism, the idea that animals are, well, if not automata, pretty close to it. In fact, I used for many years to give Descartes the, the benefit of the doubt and say that he was just suggesting a possible line of thought until I found actually evidence that he was personally, uh, personally a vivisector as well of the, of the animals he kept. No mere ideas then. Of course, it follows, no soul, no mind. They have no rights. Zoophilists, that's a nice word. It doesn't mean people... It doesn't mean people who have sex with animals. That's a modern connotation. Zoophilists simply means those who have some concern or love for animals, zoophilists. 
those who now want to have sexual relations with animals call themselves zoos or zoophilists, but this is not the context in this. Zoophilists often lose sight of the end for which animals as rational creatures were created by God, the service and use of man. In fact, Catholic do moral doctrine teaches that animals have no rights on the part of man. Now this is as early or late, however you put it, as 1962. 1962, wiping animals off the rights agenda, which partly goes to explain, I think, why the notion of rights has become so, such a seminally important discussion, and no status. Well, this is from jo the, um, Joseph Rickaby, the famous Jesuit. I mean, it's, it's a bit off the wall, it's a bit extreme even for his day, but it was a Catholic textbook. Brute beasts not having understanding and therefore not being persons cannot have any rights. We have no duties of charity nor duties of any kind to the lower animals, as neither to sticks or stones. You see, animals are progressively out of the moral picture. No status, no mind, no soul, no rationality. So just to summarize it um, a little more uh, accurately, there are three strands. The first is instrumentalism. Animals are here for our use. Again, in Augustine, it, when, if, when we say thou shalt not kill, we do not understand this of plants, since they have no sensation, nor of the rational and irrational animals, since they are dissociated from us by their want of reason, and are therefore, by the just appointment of the Creator, subject to us to kill or keep alive for our own uses. Animals, here for use, of course, it predates Augustine, might even predate uh, Aristotle certainly found in the pre-Socratics, if, if, if not earlier. Animals are here for our use. Animals are only animals. And by this, I'm picking up on the dualist tendency, especially prevalent in certain ages of Christianity, that makes distinctions and separations between flesh and spirit, mind and matter, persons and things, souls and non-souls. The result of all this, very briefly, is this. Animals come off on the worst side of each of these distinctions. And indeed, this is reflected in our language. Beasts, brutes, irrational, dumb creatures. Just think of the enormous um, damage that this historic language of, of denigration has done. I mean, in the book of uh, Common Prayer, um, the, the lines still remain, uh, brute beasts, that so we, so we do not become, quote, brute beasts that have no understanding. Uh, close quote. I've often wondered who these brutes are. Now, the third, the third strand, then, is humanism. Instrumentalism, dualism, humanism. The idea, really, that only humans matter. Uh, and you find this not just in the classical tradition, but also in modern presentations of the Christian faith. God wills nothing but man's advantage, man's true greatness, and his ultimate dignity. This, then, is God's will, man's well-being. Well, both sexist and speciesist, as you can see. That's from Hans Krung on being a Christian uh, in 1978, but also, also in the Catholic Catechism. Look at this. God willed creation as a gift addressed to man. Wow. Wow, the whole thing is ours, folks. Given to us, you know, like a birthday present. An inheritance destined for and entrusted to him. Wow, look at that. Oh, whole world is ours. Whole world is ours. What a gift from God. Only human beings matter. Only human welfare. Only human suffering matters. Everything else is periphery or at best marginal. Now, the result of all this negative tradition, first of all, theoretical, we have effectively deified the human species. Uh, we have made human beings God. Uh, there is a more or less absolute identification of God's will with humanity. Now, I myself believe this is a kind of idolatry. It is based on the assumption that God is wholly or chiefly concerned with the welfare of the human species to the exclusion of all else. And that's, folks, where I think we are. And the second result, practical, is that animals don't matter. Um, despite some reservations and qualifiers, um, still a great many Christians don't believe that animals matter because they don't matter theologically. That is, they don't matter to God the Creator. 
And that is why Christian churches are still generally indifferent to the issue of animal cruelty, abuse, and exploitation. And as a witness of that, you only have to look at the very conservative uh, Christian churches, um, the Catholic tradition especially in relation to uh, bullfighting, for example, uh, whaling, again, Norway, conservative Lutheran tradition, sealing, both Anglicans and Catholics have justified sealing, and so on and so forth. There's even a Christian... Uh, Christian Bowman's Association in the States that uh, shoots animals with the thumb bows and arrows. Good, well, that's the bad news, folks. Now let's try and look at some of the more positive news for animals. This has to be very rushed and very much an overview. Now, I think it comes in four parts, biblical insights, Christian apocryphal literature, hagiography, and then the humanitarian movement. I want briefly to run through these. Firstly, biblical insights. Well, we got so accustomed to so much of this stuff that we've actually forgotten uh, how radical and interesting it is. Let's just go through them. See, Genesis 1, in the first creation saga, humans are created with, hum with animals on the same day of creation. They're blessed by God. They're given their own space to flourish. They are made part of an originally very good creation. In other words, they have value in themselves, uh, and we should rightly feel a kind of kinship with them. Genesis doesn't say, look here, folks, it's all for you, do as you like. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that everything in the Bible supports an animal liberationist perspective. Far from it. But I do think we've rather lost sight of some of those foundational insights in the biblical material that are a great deal more animal-friendly than we dared suppose. Indeed, they are included within the covenant. Um, the covenant is made with living creatures five times and with the earth twice. Now, the theological significance of this notion of covenant really can't be minimized. I spent five years of my life studying Karl Barth's doctrine of creation, and he makes a great deal of how humanity, human beings, are elected in Christ. All of humanity is elected in Christ um, because of the notion of covenant and election in Genesis. Well, it completely, completely overlooks the fact that in Genesis 9, God also elects, enters into a covenant with all living creatures, okay? not just human beings. Thirdly, humans have dominion. Now, this is normally associated, normally interpreted as something anti-animals, as despotic rule over animals. In fact, in the States, there's now a, an anti-dominionist um, movement amongst uh, animal people. I'm afraid it's all based on a mistake. I'm sorry, folks, but dominion doesn't mean absolute rights. It means that humans' power is derived and dependent power. We are, in other words, commissioned by God to look after the world. Our only power over animals, theologically and Christologically, is a power to serve. Now, how do we know that that's the case? Well, we know that's the case because if you look at the first saga in Genesis, 25, 26, verse 25, 26, we're made in the image of God, then we're given dominion, 28, and then we're given a vegetarian diet, verse 29 to 30. Most, most Christians don't remember that bit. You know. They remember a bit about being made in the image of God. They remember the bit about having dominion. They like those ideas, and then they're given a vegetarian diet. It's one of the, my, one of the, one of the examples of you know, hermeneutics, really, how we find those things we like. So what you have in Genesis is okay, uh, herb-eating herb um, human beings. I mean, this is hardly a license for tyranny, is it, if you think about it? So dominion, the whole saga of Genesis 1 is per animal. So indeed is Genesis 2 in, in, the, in the second chapter. You have, human, you have God making the garden and then creating human beings, quote, to till it and serve it, chapter 2, verse 17. Till it and serve it. In other words, we are, that is our purpose, to serve the garden, you see, to look after the show. Also, in various um, passages in the Old Testament, there is a notion that there are moral limits to what we may do to animals. And in their own day were significant, although arguably not so much in ours. And also, not least of all, the vision of the peaceable kingdom, which you find in Isaiah, in Genesis, in Genesis as epitomized by um, the Sabbath coming together, the end of um, Genesis 1 being the Sabbath experience, after all, 
not, um, but, you know, they all sat and uh, they all enjoyed God's presence, having God having worked. And so therefore, it was an anticipation of the future kingdom to come. And also you find a hint of that in that very strange verse in Mark 12, 1, 12, 13, about Jesus being with the wild beasts. Now, moving on, also the theme of the redemption of all creation found uh, most especially in Romans 8, in which Paul compares creation to being in a state of childbirth, awaiting for its freedom and liberation with the children of God. In other words, the scope, the scope of um, redemption is cosmic, not just individual souls are going to be redeemed, but indeed the entire creation. Indeed, I've often got into theological hot water by saying, you know, when I'm asked, do I believe animals will be in heaven, my answer is they will certainly be there. The, the real question is whether sinful, violent, wicked human beings will be there. That's, that's the really big issue. <laughs> okay, biblical insights and themes then. Fellow creatureliness, kinship, peaceableness, unity of all creatures in Christ, humans as the servant species. As I've made, try to argue in my books, humans are best defined not as the master species, but as the servant species. Now, time is pressing on, so I'm going to go even faster at this point. Secondly, the Christian apocryphal material. Um, from the 2nd to the 8th century, there's a huge, voluminous amount, actually, of material um, concerning animals, Christian material, that develops some of the ideas in Scripture and especially in the Gospels. Now, by saying it's apocryphal, I don't mean it's worthless. I don't mean... Uh, it has no authority. I just mean it has never been collected together as scripture as such, Christian scripture. But nevertheless, there is a, and this is really the, uh, the thesis I'm trying to make here, that even though that there has been, as it were, a negative tradition and the dominant voices have been negative, there has been, as it were, a subterraneous, subterranean tradition within Christianity that has always kept alive the idea of peaceable, friendly relations with animals. And you see these in these stories that have been preserved from the 8th to the, to the, for the 2nd to the 8th century. For example, there is um, a famous pericope, a famous story of Jesus healing a mule, which is, um, sadly, we cannot be sure uh, when it was written, but is, um, but is very similar to those other stories in the Synoptic Gospels. Again, those are more examples of that hagiography. And also, let me give you a Chinese puzzle that I've recently been wrestling with. Um, some years ago, I had to write a, an introduction to um, uh, one of my books, um, Animal Gospel, that was to be published in China. And I thought, gosh, how am I going, what am I going to say? How can I... <laughs> Uh, what can I say to another culture, I mean, about animal rights? I mean, they'll think I'm, this is really way off. And then, of course, I began to research something of the religious history in China, and I found out that there was indeed the first Chinese church, sometimes known as the religion of the light or the Taoist church, existed for 300 years. And it taught reverence for life, vegetarianism, opposed slavery, advocated the equality of women and men, and testimony, there's testimony from a historic stele um, in AD 781, as well as from the existing sutras, the verses from that period. Now, isn't that astonishing? So here you have an early pacifist, vegetarian, feminist church, almost sounds too good to be, to be true, folks, um, almost too good to be true. Perhaps it is too good to be true, except it does have a connection with the Gospel of the Ebionites, and is very similar in some of its theology to the Gospel of the Ebionites, which is a very early gospel that depicts Jesus as a vegetarian and opposed to animal sacrifice. Now, Hagiog, no, we're going back, are we? We're going, oh yes, here we are. Some more stuff um, from hagiography. The one I particularly like is from Bonaventure. Every creature is by its nature a kind of effigy and likeness of the eternal wisdom. St. Bonaventure, the biographer of St. Francis, every creature is by its nature a kind of effigy and likeness of the eternal wisdom. Okay, 
The theological significance of this hagiography is this. As we grow in union with God, so we should grow in communion with God's creatures. And concern for God's other creatures is a sign of greatness, if anything. And thirdly, that the creator has interests above and beyond the human species. Now, the last piece of the good news is the humanitarian movement in the 19th century. If my thesis is right, despite the pervasiveness of the negative, dominant negative voices, there, has been, there have been traditions of concern for regard for animals within the Christian tradition right from the start. And suddenly in the 19th century, this began to be crystallized in the form of uh, embodied in social, um, social institutions. William Cowherd founds the Bible Christian Church, which makes vegetarianism obligatory for its members. It's a forerunner of the organized vegetarian movement in the UK and the US. Then in 1824, we have the founding of the SPCA, shortly to become the RSPCA, by the Anglican priest Arthur Broom. And then we even have the anti-vivisection movements in the 1870s with ecclesial, venerable ecclesiastical patronage. And the famous line I like from this, this, this emerging humanitarian movement is from Humphrey Primitt, well-known line from his book, The Duty of Mercy and the Sin of Cruelty. We may pretend to what religion we please, but cruelty is atheism. We may make our base to Christianity, but cruelty is infidelity. We may trust to our orthodoxy, but cruelty is the worst of heresies. Now, as we know, this influenced Arthur Broom, who subsequently um, edited uh, the second edition of Primit's work. Broom, after all, was the founder of the RSPCA. Now, where does all this lead to? Well, um, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to section three on the maybe, and so I want to leave you with this final thought when it comes to the second section. Uh, what I've called the Jesus-shaped ethic. Um, we don't know everything that Jesus said or did, and, and in many ways we're still trying to grapple with its significance. Uh, we don't know the... the um, the details, but we do know the contours. And what one finds in Jesus, I suggest, is a paradigm, or at least rather what I called a paradigm of inclusive moral generosity. One that privileges the poor, the vulnerable, the outcast, the marginalized, the oppressed, and I believe, by extension, animals. And I believe some of the, the best thinkers in the Christian tradition have grasped this relationship. But the struggle still goes on between these two vastly different approaches to animals within the Christian tradition, and I fear the jury is still out as to which side might eventually win. Thank you very much indeed.